Stephen Mitchell and welcome to my notes on a call sheet. Uh, a lot of people I have worked with in my decades in this business were people who were starting out. I ran a repertory company for film and TV for uh, 20 years, I guess, in Los Angeles. And we made, rather than uh, producing plays, we made films and television shows. We used the TV shows primarily to uh, as training wheels to season and develop uh, our actors so that when we put them in one of our movies they made a bigger impact and helped the movie make a bigger impact. Um, what I discovered which seems pretty obvious to anyone that, that takes a look at it is that there are far too many people wanting to get into the business than there is room in the business for them to occupy. And most of the expert advice, unfortunately, for that reason, is given to newcomers for the convenience of the person giving the advice rather than for the convenience of the person receiving it. So you could get all this wonderful advice from a Hollywood expert and find that it leads you into the parking lot uh, where you're out of their hair as opposed to being in the stadium on the 50-yard line taking snaps where you'd rather be. Uh, and you can understand this. There's nothing malicious about this. They just don't have time to devote to all of the newcomers coming to Hollywood, and they come on a daily basis. So you can imagine the problem that confronts Hollywood with. So they needed a lot of filters and gatekeepers, and they have them. They've created pathways that take you through the casting director office, if you can even get into it. And even if you can, the odds of you getting through the casting office and into the director's office are, uh, are, are very small. And uh, not a lot of people make that transition. Um, so <clears throat> the advice I would give somebody uh, is to go directly to the person who hires the product you're offering. So if you're an actor, I would be talking to film directors. The number of film directors who have seen my work and have been excited by it would be my main statistic that I would pay attention to. That said, um, it's very important before you even contemplate making contact with a film director or trying to get his or her attention, is that you should understand what it is you're selling them. And not a lot of actors give much thought to that, uh, certainly not in the two decades I ran my repertory company. The, how should I say this, the, the common understanding of an actor is that they needed to be able to do everything and consequently uh, they saw themselves as a blank canvas on which the filmmaker could paint. And uh, as an associate of mine used to say, likely the only direction you're going to get from a director is action and cut. So you better come with the goods or you're not going to be invited. Um, as you start to think about oh, all your favorite filmmakers, we can use the word star or, the, or, or important actors or, or meaningful actors to you. They all had something in common with each other. And that is, one, they had nothing in common <laughs> with the other actors. They were unique in terms of their personality and combination of characteristics, if you want to look at it that way. Jack Nicholson is nothing like Clint Eastwood, who is nothing like Bogart, who is nothing like McQueen, who is nothing like Woody Allen. They're, they're not exactly to the dimension of snowflakes where everyone is unique, but you could, as a generality, say so. The other thing is that they all had a unique and unforgettable brand, something that made them themselves and identifiable within a line of dialogue, practically. If you, if you look at Jack Nicholson from as early as Easy Rider and taking him through his career, whether you're talking about Chinatown or Witches of Eastwick or uh, A Few Good Men, the Batman movie. Um, they were all different genre, dramas, farce, comedy, cartoon. 
um, he was always Jack Nicholson, but within a within a a different range of mix. He he the the mix of characteristics would be reshuffled each time. So in as good as his in as good as it gets, he was a little different than he was in A Few Good Men. But all the characteristics, that insubordinate, mischievous, um, outrageous, unpredictable quality was present in the roles he played. That was his brand. That is his brand. And it's important for you to have a brand because as we consider Hollywood, um, there's a, f a saying that comes into play that I really like. I wish I knew who who said it first because it was great. Probably one of the old studio moguls, but I don't know. But it went something like this. The problem with the film business as a business is that it's an art form. And the problem with the film business as an art form is that it's a business. And as an actor, you are like a BMW any guy who's a car guy at all to any degree and a lot of women I've noticed have the understanding that BMW is the ultimate driving machine. A lot of people have the understanding that Volvos are very safe cars and I guess everybody that's seen one understands that Ferraris are red sexy things that go very fast. So you start to see how in, how indigenous branding is to the marketing of a product and the acceptance of a product. If Ferrari started making tractors and decided they want to compete with John Deere tractors, um, I don't think many people would stop buying John Deere tractors to buy a Ferrari tractor. I may be wrong, but I, I just think that's the case. And people who want the Ferrari name want it on something red and sexy. So more often than not, in fact, I think 80% of all Ferraris are sold in the color of red. And almost 100% of them are resold in red. I had a few myself that when I went to sell them, I, I painted them red because they sold much faster. Anyway, uh, movies are big business. Uh, although movies are made... Hollywood is a is a small area of Southern California. Hollywood is actually a, a a global marketplace, and Hollywood as a state of mind is also global. But even though even though the Hollywood studios make their film centrally uh, in a particular locale, they count on selling them all over the planet in every language that they can. So it's a big business. It's a global business. And they think in terms of, of product, and they think in terms of, of franchise. In the old days, when the studios basically owned the actors through contract, they understood the brand of each of their players and protected it. For example, uh, Clark Gable, when he um, went in front of the cameras, he was pretty much invincible. And when his home studio wasn't using him, they would loan him out to other studios for a fee. And in their contract, they had franchise protections written into the contract. For example, uh, no, other st uh, no studio could put Clark Gable into a movie in which he'd be defeated by anything other than an act of God because they wanted to protect his image. Well... It worked very nicely, and in fact, the only time Clark Gable was defeated was by an act of God in a movie called The San Francisco Earthquake. So we might ask, who's protecting your franchise? As an actor, what are your characteristics? They, they start to show by the way you look, the way you talk, the way you sound. These, these are the, the opening gambit in the, in the, in the reveal of your brand and then beyond that what do you what do you project as you speak and what do you enjoy doing as an actor are you unpredictable or are you conservative are you safe or enigmatic are you dangerous are you um, seductive or are you an intellectual counterpuncher 
In other words, these are the things that make up you and define you as a product that people will want to see once they've had the experience of it. They'll want to see more of it. And they're going to be a little bit disappointed if next time you come out, they don't see that. It's as though you've offered them a Coca-Cola for the first time in their life, and they say, well, I kind of like this. And then they go buy another can three weeks later, and it tastes like watermelon juice. It's going to be something of a surprise and a disappointment. That's not to say that you can't surprise them and that you can't offer them new experiences, but I think you want to do that within the scope of your brand to the extent that you can do this. Now, once you've decided what your brand is, that's the time to start working on technique. Now, my technique, Action Reaction, is the only acting technique on planet Earth that I'm aware of, and that may be kind of a, an extravagant claim, but it's the only one I'm aware of that doesn't cause you or wants you to be in the moment and feel emotions. Because my theory, my practice, is that I'm not so interested in what you feel, but I'm very interested in what the audience is feeling. I once made a movie in Las Vegas. We were in a suite of rooms at the, uh, oh, the Stardust Hotel, I guess it was. And I had uh, three people in the scene, uh, a con man, his mark, and a bird dog. And the con man was sitting in an easy chair and, and the mark and the bird dog were sitting on a sofa and I had them in a three-shot master and it was great. And the, and the scene was opening very nicely. And I noticed that at a certain point, the um, bird dog is trying not to laugh. He's trying to, to hide a smile because he doesn't, doesn't want to give away the show to the, uh, to the mark. And I thought this would be a great moment to cut in and see that reaction. So I went to his close-up and I looked at the whole close-up and not once on the close-up did he smile. In fact, most of the time he's staring out the window. And I was kind of surprised by that, and I asked him what, what, it, what was happening. And he told me, well, I was in the moment. And I thought about that for a moment, and yes, the, the master that I shot, that I liked so much with the, the suppressed smile, was take five. And the close-up, after we'd covered, you know, two shots and reverse shots and back and forth and got to his close-up, was take 27. And by take 27, he was in the moment, but the moment he was in was boredom. And he felt because that's what he was feeling that it was justified. He didn't stop to think that take 27 had to match what was going on in take 5, or I wouldn't be able to cut it together. Well, he found out real quickly, and so, so did I. So it became very important to me to let actors know to put the audience in the moment. They're, they're buying the ticket. They get the emotional ride. They get the experience. You're the technician. You're the magician making them feel that. So when I cut from at, you know, at 2 minutes 30 seconds of take 5 to 2 minutes 31 seconds of take 27, it's got to look like the same minute, the same energy, the same action, the same look. Otherwise, um, well, I have to throw away the, 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 the close-up. It doesn't work, and that's exactly what I had to do. A lot of actors who are in a film for the first couple of times, may, you may hear them say, well, I was in a movie, but um, my scene got cut out. I'd wager that most of the time the scene got cut out because their takes wouldn't cut together. They weren't matching. They hadn't learned to duplicate uh, from from scene to scene, or from take to take, so that the scene could actually be cut together into an integral whole. Um, it is true that occasionally a director will say, do something a little different, and of course you do what he asks or she asks. But generally, when you come with a performance, you want each performance to be the same so that he can use all of the cuts and not have to throw any of them away because they don't fit in. So now, 
my technique that I've created, um, Action Reaction, you can buy the book about it on Amazon if you want, is, is basically designed for a particular purpose, and that is it's, it's intended to groom actors for lead roles. Now, why is that? Well, when I had my repertory company, and we had, oh, at any given time, an average of 100 actors as part of our studio repertoire, uh, repertory company, um, I wanted to be able to star any one of them in a movie because as an actor they were fascinating and could interest us and hold our attention. Even if, even in bit parts you'll see in uh, uh, the films I did, even the, even the very small parts had that quality because I wanted that quality in all of my actors. So if, I, if we saw somebody in one of my movies and he was just a, a homeless guy pushing a cart down the, the alleyway, as in Bleeder and Bates, for example, you could say he would make a, an interesting character to star in a movie. And in fact, the guy I'm referring to starred in a very popular TV show I did, uh, one of my inter interview series. His name was Al Dashna. So um, I wanted everybody to have that quality. To have that quality, they each had the ability, first of all, in understanding what their brand is, and then we developed a technique that allowed them to deliver that brand effectively through dialogue, through unspoken dialogue, through intention, and through emotion. So all of this became very important to me to uh, instill in each of my actors. Well, the repertory company lasted for about 20 years. It was very successful. I finally uh, dismantled it because my life changed to a degree and I did, did more traveling and I went off to uh, Europe and made a film called Point of Departure which I shot in uh, Paris and Cannes and Venice and Milan and um, Monaco and it was more like a vacation than, uh, than, than work and uh, that was more or less at that point the, the um, repertory company uh, came to a halt and for many years I never thought much about the action reaction technique until I decided at one point to give a webinar about it and I, I gave a webinar and it was very popular and then I wrote the book and that's been very popular and recently I've been offering the uh, the uh, technique to actors on Skype all over the world. And in so doing, it's funny, I've created a, a, a repertory company of sorts with the actors. So I've, I've sort of come full circle by way of teaching this uh, uh, technique again to individuals. And I'm now producing one-man shows with some of these actors uh, for pay-per-view. In any case, what you want to understand in, in launching a career, and you might be launching a career even though you've been in your career for 10 years and all you've done is under fives. Uh, you may still be in the position of having to launch that career because it's not where you want it to be. But the, the thing to understand is one, what is your brand? And make sure it shows and is evident in everything you do. Whether it's two lines of dialogue in a bit part or a, a major scene in, a, in, a, in, a, in an independent movie or a lead in an independent film. Uh, you want that brand to be on display because once you've made the audience want it, you want to keep delivering it. Uh, the other thing is having perfected what this brand is and, it, and having assured yourself this is the most effective route for you to take as an actor, the next thing is to start selling it to people who can buy it my dad was in the insurance business, and he, uh, for a long time, life insurance, and he, life insurance is sold in the home. So my dad would make an appointment with someone to come out to their home and sell, talk to them about life insurance. The first question he would ask is, will your wife be there? He asked this question because he knows that it's the wife who buys the insurance policy. 
guys typically don't want to buy life insurance. They want to buy Corvettes or BMWs or 57 Chevys with candy apple paint. They're not looking forward to spending, you know, a few hundred dollars uh, a month on a piece of paper that's going to sit in a drawer till they die. Um, but the wife is has a vested interest in that purchase. So he knew that if the wife wasn't there, he wasn't going to get a sale. So he'd ask, will the wife be there? And if she's there, he goes. If not, he reschedules to when she will be there. Now, this was smart. And my father was the first man in the United States to sell a million dollars worth of life insurance in one year, which is pretty extraordinary coming back from the war. Uh, so he used that to good effect. Now, how can you use this? Well, I'm not saying don't approach casting directors, but the fact is casting directors don't actually hire you. They're a filtering device. Conceptually, you might see their job is to say no 27 times out of 30. And they let those three out of 30 go through to the, to the guy who can actually buy and sell them, or buy their product, I should say. And that would be the film director. And so the question conceptually I would ask uh, with a practical application attached to it is, how many film directors have seen your work as an actor or as an actress? And if that number is less than 30, 40, 50, 60, then you haven't launched your career yet. And in this day and age with uh, the internet, with YouTube, with um, all sorts of attraction magnets you can use on the internet to attract the attention of the people you've targeted, you don't have to knock on doors anymore. You can make them come to you. I had a great campaign with my original story ideas in getting uh, top directors and producers to call me to buy my original story ideas. And I would just put something out on display where they would see it and they end up calling me. And that's my approach to uh, marketing actors. If the Muhammad, I would say if, if the mountain won't come down Muhammad, there's no point in being Muhammad. Sometimes, if you understand marketing, the game is to make your public call you so you don't have to knock on their doors. I sold a lot of stories to people who, had I knocked on their door, I'd have been given the bum's rush. But because I put something in their line of sight that they responded to uh, and, and called me about, I had some very nice sales transacting, and you can too. Well, at this point, if I were in a webinar, I'd open this up to questions. And uh, But feel free, if you want, to contact me via email. Uh, if you want to take Skype classes with me, I'm open to that too. But uh, feel free to um, check my blog. It's em. EMCPB uh, at Blogspot, and you can uh, see the address and, and information on the information uh, accompanying this podcast. Uh, this is my first podcast, so forgive me the rough edges and the fact that my voice is not in great shape today, but I hope I gave you something to think about. And whether you are an actor, a writer, or director, the concept of branding and subsequently the concept of, of smart marketing is very applicable because you're trying to get into a business that practically everybody on planet Earth at one time or another has wanted to join. And uh, you expect to actually implement that decision. And as I did, uh, I found it, it took more than just time and effort. It took being very smart and proactive. I, I spent 10 years wanting to be a filmmaker before I got on a plane, went to Paris, France, and made my first film and made it happen. And uh, you can do that too, whether it's Hollywood or New York or London or Paris. So uh, I wish you all luck. I hope this was informative and that you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll probably do another one in, in another week or so. Maybe you'll join me then. Thank you very much.
Bye.